Talking financial organization and a professional practice does not have to be boring. Are you ready for a few money in, money out ideas? It's Susan Gunn coming directly to your head to make you think. Can you handle the truth? Because she is known for being energetic, laughs a lot, and gives honest, sometimes direct, but always practical advice. It's time now for Money In, Money Out. Whistleblowers. Wow. I've been in the workforce since I was 14 years old, and I've experienced many things as an employee that were unsafe, questionable, maybe some employer uh, fraudulent activity. That'd be the nice way to say it. I would say we've all had firsthand experience to some degree at some point in time during our work life. We've had some famous whistleblowers throughout our history. I don't know if anybody remembers Karen Silkwood. She was a chemist that raised safety concerns in a nuclear facility and very mysteriously died in 1974 in the midst of raising her concerns. Very mysterious. I remember that. I was in high school. Or how about Sharon Watkins that exposed the Enron Corporation for their huge fraud that destroyed that company, several others that fell in their wake, and, oh my gosh, the employee pensions. Um, That was heartbreaking. One of my favorites, Cynthia Cooper. She was an internal auditor for MCI Worldcom. She wrote a book called Extraordinary Circumstances. Truly, truly insightful. If you've not read that, I I recommend it. I'll put a link in the show notes. I met her several years ago at a broadcast. Loved our conversation. And she is, what we call in the South, genuine folk. So what is a whistleblower? Simply stated, it's a person who informs on a person or organization engaged in an illicit activity. There are lots of varying degrees that we'll talk about today, but that's the simple definition. So why this topic? Well, there was a recent article in a dental industry magazine about whistleblowers in the dental industry. And timely enough, I just read about a case in a dental Facebook group about an associate whistleblowing on a doctor. So here to join me on this riveting topic are my colleagues, Teresa Duncan with Odyssey Management, and my first male to the podcast, Kevin Henry, the co-founder of Ignite DA. All right. (laughs) Say hi, guys. Hello. I am so glad to represent the male side of things. Thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) So just just to to have a disclaimer, all three of us are really good friends. So this should be interesting. Um, We will keep it, you know, on topic, you know, maybe. And if Kevin starts talking about baseball, no, he won't. You you won't do that. I won't today. I want to, but I won't. So Okay. (laughs) So then Teresa will just roll her eyes at us. But it's true. You know, Karen Silkwood was kind of a blast from the past. Kevin, she was from Oklahoma. Do you remember her story? I do actually. I think uh, I've seen the movie a few times. Yeah. I'm trying. I was trying to remember Silkwood. who was starring. Yep, that, yeah, that was Silkwood, the name 19, of it. Yes, 1983, and it's Meryl Streep. Meryl, Meryl Streep ah, and Meryl Streep. Uh, Cher. And was it Kurt Russell who was the? Yeah, I think so. Husband, but yeah, no, that was one of my favorite movies growing up. And um, I usually make a joke in class that nobody understands, which is you know you need the Silkwood bath after dealing with you know some of your patients and only people my age understand that reference it's when they they thought you were radioactive and they took you into this big thing and scrubbed the heck out of you and uh nobody gets that so i don't use it anymore it's so sad you could probably drop the whole monsters inc thing you know where they have to they think that they've been touched by a human yeah yeah, (laughs) that's That's a better one yep Yeah. yeah that was uh you know Even in her death, she brought attention to what was going on because I don't know if you guys remember her, all of her documents and everything were not in her car Mm -hmm. in the accident. And they still believe that it was a uh, staged accident that killed her. I mean, it was not an accident. accident. It's yeah, it's accident in quotation marks. I don't think anybody really buys it was, you know, a true accident. So. Yeah, it was uh, very interesting. 
I kind of went back and was reading more about that, but she was a, a pretty big one. Then there's she been was. some great stories coming out of that. But so, Teresa, yes, tell us about the different varieties of whistleblowing. So in reading up on it, it sounds like there's a couple different protections for whistleblowers. The big one that everybody really thinks about are the ones that the federal government will protect you for, you know, like basically if something's going on in the government, maybe you find something out at the Department of Labor or CIA or whatever, there's a federal whistleblower protection act that will um, ensure your safety. And, And I say that I'm really just saying what they say. I don't know if I necessarily believe that, but they ensure your safety and will uh, protect you from any retaliation. That That's the key part is retaliation against you from the company. Um, yeah, not insure, so sure. insure is in quotes. Yeah, and, and also the whole thing about from the company, it doesn't say from the public or from the media or whatever. So there is uh, that kind of protection act. And it really has to do with people who do business with the federal government and state local municipalities. So um, the reason why it comes up in dental a lot is because a lot of offices do work with Medicaid and some even with Medicare, depending on their structure. Now there's a lot of offices that don't though. So what about them? The whole whistleblower piece, there is a, a another law that we researched, you and I, Susan, called the Sarbanes-Oxley law that will protect a publicly traded company, uh, employees of a publicly traded company, I believe. And then the last thing that I was looking at is if you're a private company, like say it's my old boss, maybe I wanted to blow the whistle on him or something, What the which I would never do. The um, office, what offices should have is some sort of dedicated third-party helpline or um, ethics line that they can call. And if you have that, then that looks good if things go south. It, but if you don't have that and somebody says, hey, you're breaking this law, that law, whatever, um, you as a company, because you haven't implemented something like that, it might go a little harder on you. But that's really the extent of my expertise in the law side. Yeah. So um, there was a Facebook thread. I have to figure out how to say this about employees that were complaining about, and this actually Facebook happens on Facebook threads all the time, complaining about their dentist and saying that they're going to report them to the state dental boards and, and whatnot. Just to be clear, there's no protection for that. Mm -mm. That's not whistleblowing. So with, with the Medicaid case and that there was that article that you referenced and, you know, in a, in a magazine and there were dental assistants who made buku money by turning in right. their uh, their employer. I guess, well, the whole office, really, the yeah, the, the, the whole corporation, yeah. And because they were doing Medicaid and and they were able to go in and find extra fraud, they made a ton of money on that. So uh, now the bad thing is their names are public. Actually, they allowed their names mm-hmm. to go public, which is fine. So does that affect you know their employability? I guess. Uh, in in the area or, you know, what kind of retaliation will they have um, privately? So there's there's just a lot wrapped up in that article. I'm glad we're talking about it because there's I'm, I'm sure those women are thinking we're thinking I have a decent job here. I'm making decent money. I have family maybe that really depends on it. But this is really wrong. So I'm sure they had some dilemma they needed to work through. Yeah. And, and, you know, you bring up the dental assistant side of things and, you know, working with, working with the assistants around the country, one of the things that I, I always hear about are the practices who have the lax infection control standards. The ones, as you mentioned, who might be doing some, some creative accounting, shall we say, uh, you know, we, we do know that that happens. And I know that there are a lot of dental assistants out there as well as other team members that they are, they struggle with that. They struggle with, do I say something? Do I actually come forward with this? How do I make sure that our our patients are safe and we're doing things the right way? And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they're a little bit more emboldened now than they were before the pandemic, just because of everything that's going on with hiring in this country and dentistry, as well as every other profession, uh, you know, from restaurant workers on down. Uh, There are a lot of dental assistants who feel like, well, what are they going to do? Fire me? (laughs) <laughs> and, and and they really are taking a little bit bolder steps in saying things now about what should be changed in the practice. So 
I, I would not be surprised if we start hearing more and more things come out because I really think the team has felt like they're in a little bit more control of the situation just because there's fewer of them out there now to fill mm-hmm. open positions. Yeah, it's definitely an employee's market. You know, they are uh, able to kind of make their demands known. I, I just, I really cringe though when I read things on a public forum, and which Facebook is a public forum. Even if it's a Facebook group, there are people in there and it's a public forum and they'll post stuff that just blast. I mean, I've read things and they're still working there. Sure. It- yeah. I've, I've sent plenty of private messages and even put it in the post. You should probably take this down because now everybody knows your doctor is committing fraud. Mm-hmm. I mean, I put that right in there and, and it yeah. does go away and I get messages like, Oh my God, how so? Or thank you. Or, you know, usually they will take it down. I think one left it up and uh, who knows, but yeah, it, it's amazing what kind of stuff people put out there. I mean, they'll, they'll post pictures of patients information and all that. Oh, yeah. and it's like, Hey, Hey, ever heard of yeah. HIPAA? And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. And there's no protection for that. Mm-mm. That's what I keep saying. There's, you know, you are really flying it out there in the wind um, and may suffer some consequences for that. And, and one of the biggest problems, I think, with that, uh, because I see it in the dental system Facebook groups as well, and I have to remind them that I can click on your profile. I can. It doesn't mm-hmm. take me long to figure out where you work, who you work right. for. But it's also, there are times that it's such a um, almost shark fest, for lack of a better term, that people see something posted out there and then they try to top it. Or they try to do something even more outlandish just to get the reactions. And I think that we've got to, as a community, as a society, take a step back and say, that's not how you need to approach something if it's going on in your practice. And and I was glad you hear you talked about the, that ethics line or ways that people can actually get this off their chest and say, something's wrong in this practice. And we've got to fix it. Well, a lot yeah. of these groups, you can, you, the administrator has to flip a switch, but you can make it so that there's anonymous posts and the administrator of the group is the only one who can see who actually posted it. So, I mean, do it that way for crying out loud. Don't out your whole office. Yeah. Right. Right. Or asking for a friend. Always. Mm. <laughs> yeah. A <laughs> when friend you know of the, mine said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when they're really not. Yeah. The, there was a recent article in the fraud magazine about whistleblowing and in there too. And they just said, you know, your personal and professional lives will suffer. And so just, just thinking that it's an easy thing to do. Let me call this attorney and let me jump them on this case. Cause if they lose the case, I mean, just because you've got the information doesn't mean you're going to win a whistleblowing lawsuit. So the, there's a lot of criteria too, to, to, actually bringing a whistleblower lawsuit to light Uh, in the articles that we were reading ahead of time. It seems like in this particular case, there were some hurdles because in a case that size dealing with Medicaid, Mm -hmm. you can't just blow a whistle and wait for a check to come. You actually have to get the information. You have to go to a law firm. They have to file um, a brief. I believe it's a, is it a quitam brief or it's, it's a different brief. And they actually have to file a lawsuit on your behalf and on behalf of the, that government. And then, then it will be taken, you know, forward. But, and most law firms from what I was reading will do that based on contingency. However, that's a lot of steps for somebody who just wants to say, Hey, this person's billing out too many PAs, you know? So you really, I'm sure the, in the case of these women, they saw some very egregious, it sounds like very egregious uh, examples. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the whistleblowers got 1.5 million. So that was quite hefty, but there was a lot of work that went into, like you were saying, Mm -hmm. to make that case happen. And they have to get all of the information about the accounting and payments. And so somehow behind the scenes, they were, um, so to me, that's almost kind of goes to an ethical line there that they're taking information from the practice and providing it to the uh, law firm without the permission of the practice owner. Yeah. I I don't know. I guess if there's laws extended that 
I guess if there's protection laws. Yeah, that's a different one. Kevin, you were going to say something. Sorry. Well, no, 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 go ahead. Uh, and then I'm going to throw out a little different scenario, but go ahead. Yeah, just the ethics piece. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. I agree with you. It seems kind of shady that you're, you know, gathering this information, but it is in the interest of the greater good. So, you know, by you doing this, you're helping tons of kids who otherwise would be subjected right. to unnecessary whatevers they were doing. Right. You know, and, and there are cases out there, while they not may not fit the whistleblower definition per se, but I, I know of team members that their last act of dental practice is sending something to the state dental board about what's going on in that practice and that they need to be checked out or to OSHA. I know one of the big cases that has come up in recent months about an OSHA fine came because an employee was leaving the practice and that was her last act there was to tip them off about something. So it, it happens. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I know these organizations just talking to people who do training for them that if it's one of those last things that they do, I mean, in that case, it sounds like there was a lot going on, but typically right. when it's a, a something they do on the last day or afterwards, they look at that as almost a little bit of a retaliation. They look to see Definitely. if there's motives behind that. So it looks, to, it seems to me like if you're going to, report you should report while you're there so it's not and you can do that anonymously for osha um and and i i don't know about hipaa i don't know the rules on that you might want to talk to somebody who does know that better but yeah for osha you can do that anonymously and then mm-hmm. you know act all surprised when they what? come in what who's this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let me move my big mac from in front of the sterilizer <laughs> you know <laughs> right. so what are what are some really practical things? I mean, the podcast listeners are in every realm of business. And so at every level and in primarily dentistry, but what are some things that the owners can do? Let's take, break it down. What are some things that the owners can do to handle, to prevent? So I would say encourage open communication. I mean, if there's, feedback that's accepted and encouraged. I mean, you're not going to be in this situation, but I mean, let's be brutally honest. If, if you're trying to avoid this situation, the best thing an owner can do is just not be shady. I mean, that's, that's it. The shade, this doesn't happen because doctors judgments like that don't happen because doctors are angels and doing all sorts of great things. It's doctors who are blatantly trying to get away with things. And we've all dealt with that. And and not just doctors, but owners who are not doctors too. I mean, corporations have had their fair share, uh, fair share of, um, I guess, exposure when it comes to this. And, and I know that there are a lot of dental practices that, when their employees get, shall we say, empowered, they they get very nervous about that because they don't want them to have a voice. They don't want them to feel like that they can raise a hand and say, "Why are we doing something this way?" But yet I can tell you, again, going back to this being a very employee driven time in our society right now, it's important to have, as you said, Teresa, those open lines of communication for people to feel like that if something goes against what they believe, they can actually ask about it or or request a meeting about it without having Mm -hmm. uh, being looked down upon. Yeah. You know, I got to say, I'm always surprised when I hear about a practice that's not having a team meeting in the morning. Well, to me, of, that just seems um, like a really simple thing to do before yes. you start seeing patients. Yes, but, and let me be the other side of this. I'm a fan of daily meetings, don't get me wrong, but there are certain offices where it's just not set up to be practical. You know, a lot of times there's teams aren't there at the same time. And I know a lot of offices that meet during the day. Um, but at some point, one of the team members, doctor, owner, manager, has to pay attention to what's going on. So I get that a daily meeting just to check in with everything is a great way of encouraging feedback, but that's not going to be the silver bullet. You know, that's not what's going to make it work. Well, there's not going to be a silver bullet. That's what we've learned in embezzlement. That's true. There is no silver silver bullet. If they're determined to do something, they'll do it anyway. Well, and I think. But at least if you had that level of communication then the employees would feel free to bring a concern to you as a owner. A lot of times consultants are clued in on this. 
And, you know, if you're not sure what to do with it, that, that can be a problem. But if you're a consultant out there listening, if something, if somebody comes to you with this, this is not something that they can just, um, work out. <laughs> yeah. They're not just going to get over it. Uh, this is a very difficult conversation right. to have. And Susan, you're the queen of difficult conversations when it yeah. comes to this stuff. So, you know. Yeah. I, so I, I was really surprised um, when I got a phone call. It's been a while, but I got a phone call from a dentist who was co-owner in a practice with another dentist. And they didn't even have meetings. Not weekly, like at all? not bi-weekly, not monthly. No, never, never. And I'm like, what? Why? How, I never considered it. And they own that practice and a couple of others. And it's well, like, maybe why they, would you they... never? Why would you never want to know if you not to go over financials? You know, we have to. I think sometimes, especially in this industry, we think so clinical that we forget business. You know, What's that, that? We, what? I know. What's that? That's what <laughs> I've been spending 25 years trying to get across. Hmm. <laughs> well, and that's some that's, protocols we got to do. Sorry, Susan. That, that's important to realize, though, is that this is not something else that you have to do. This is almost this is a loss prevention. You really need to think about that. This is how to protect your revenue. Um, and that's really the way the way to look at it. If if you have a situation where an employee is unhappy and you think there's going to be some reporting going on, uh, maybe get in front of that. <laughs> so yeah. that doesn't happen. What a concept. Well, and, and I'm going to spin it back to the hiring thing because I think that's so important. And so many practices right now are hiring for heartbeats and they're not checking references. Yeah. They're not doing the things to prevent things from happening. You know, and, and let's be honest, some owners may not know that, you know, this is going on in their practice. And that's where the whole meetings, checking in, seeing the books, mm -hmm. hiring somebody that's actually been referred to you rather than, oh, you're off the street and you have a heartbeat, I'll take you. Absolutely. You know. <laughs> well, can we can we turn it around too? So let's turn it around even more. However, Susan wants to speak and this is her podcast, so I'll let her do that. <laughs> I'm like waving my hand, but 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 wait, wait. Because of because of what Kevin said, um, we did this little interview thing. I'm speaking in St. Louis in October. Hmm. And they did a sent out some questions and I answered it and I one of the questions um, asked why I like doing what I do. And I really had to stop and think about it. And I was trying to compel the dentists, not only because typically my embezzlement courses are the people that have been embezzled. So they come and they try to learn how to not have it happen again. Right. But really, mm -hmm. let's get in front of it because it's really stupid to think that nobody's going to steal from you if you have a practice for 30 years somebody's going to steal from you sure. Mm -hmm. and see, it's just going to happen. So with the employee market, the way it is right now, hiring for heartbeats, like you said, Kevin, that's dangerous because they're not doing the reference checks. Right. They're going, Oh, great. You know, this software awesome. And just plunging right ahead without giving any forethought. I actually think because of the market that we're in right now, the next two to three years, and especially with everything that's been happening with COVID and all of that and the shutdowns and, you know, everything. I think the next two to three years are going to be really telling on embezzlements. I think I'm going to be really busy because they're not doing their checks and people are, and the employees, they know it. Right. Yeah. And, and a friend of mine and I were talking uh, just earlier today, and we were joking about how in 2030, we're going to do a case study of how dentistry changed in 2020, you know, and how it really turned itself on its head, not just with the scheduling and the hiring, but everything that went along with it. And I hope that at that point, we're going to look back and say, we got smarter as a business because we had to get smarter as a business because of trying to come back from the shutdown and everything else that happened last year. I hope you can say that. I but, hope I, so. but I also know the joke was whenever I used to be the managing editor for dental economics is that dental economics will be the one magazine. that will never go out of business because it talks about business. 
mm-hmm. you know, and that that's mm-hmm. always was the standard joke. And it's true uh, because we know how much business knowledge that the dentist has usually heading into his or her first practice. Yeah. And so unfortunately, that's that's what I've always said. I'll be around for a while um, because yeah. embezzlement's embezzlement and where it may be slow during some periods of times, it is just about, I mean, I feel it. I hear it. I pay attention to the groups. I can, I've got my, um, in, uh, my ear to the ground to hear the hoof beats coming in the distance. And I think it's going to be a stampede. So, um, I unfortunately, the only thing that I can tell the doctors is to be aware. You've got to pay attention to your financials. You've got to be a, a pay attention to what's being billed in your insurance and where it's going. You know, make sure that the procedures are not being changed, that the amounts are not being changed. I um, mean, some very but to pay attention. And I have that wonderful service called Ask the Expert. That is two hours of very valuable time for the doctors to spend just uh, remoting into their practice software, looking through my eyes, the eyes of a fraud examiner, and seeing um, through my eyes what their systems and procedures look like. It's really valuable time, and so very, very well spent time. So that was a, a an ad in the middle of our podcast just slip that in there slip yeah it in. but it's it's definitely uh needed there's a lot of doctors who do need that third you know eye to take a look at things but the the other thing too you were talking about the hoof beats in the in the you know coming up and i i'm hearing it loud and clear i feel like i'm in mm-hmm. the stampede because when i get calls about coding there's a, so many new people and mm-hmm. they're all they're not coding correctly. The doctor's not coding correctly. They don't know what to look for. Write-offs are crazy. And then I, uh, you know, I do recommend using outsourcing if it works out. But I can tell you, if you're not vetting the outsourcing company, you have a bigger issue on your hands. And and that's something that I'm seeing is uh, new outsourcing companies that are just popping up everywhere. Established outsourcing oh, companies. Yeah. They have created huge messes, and it almost makes me want to cry. I know they're ready to cry. You know, I started out doing claims cleanup back in the day. And some of these messes I've taken a look at recently, I'm not touching with a 10 foot pole. It's too much. Wow. Mm -mm, No way. How did they get in such a mess, Teresa? They're not looking. They're not paying attention. The company that is, uh, they've outsourced to doesn't give them regular reports. Or if they do, they don't read it. And then that, that company realizes you're not reading it. So the reports just get, you know, less and less informed. And some companies I'll tell you are paid on collection. So if you've got zero payments coming in, they're going to close that claim and not appeal it. They're just going to go to the next one. If you've got high volume, there's a lot. I mean, I could definitely, you know, you should probably have Dana Moss come back on. She has one of those companies and some other people we know, but uh, outsourcing companies need to be vetted. So just real quick, I'll tell you, you ask for somebody who has had clients for a year and asked to talk to those Mm -hmm. clients, not somebody who, oh yeah, we've been employed with, they've empl- been employed with us for a year. Well, we, I want to talk to a client who's been with that person for a year because these bad seeds that these companies will rotate. And yes. uh, that's what I've seen. So I've had an embezzler that was in three states and served time in two of them. My goodness. So um, fourth, this was the fourth practice that she had been in. So, you know, you really have to do background checks and they need to be national yeah. background checks mm-hmm. and even and on I, assistance right kevin even absolutely. assistants need to be no. checked out anybody <laughs> needs to be you know and, and i mean i've heard so often oh i don't have time for that we've got to get somebody in here what if they get hired by another practice you know what the risk is worth it in my opinion to make sure that yeah. you're not bringing somebody in that's going to destroy your reputation in your practice absolutely hmm. well the other side of it susan that i would like to bring up is that yes if you are in a situation where the office is shady the doctor is shady manager is shady i don't want you to feel like you shouldn't do it because there's going to be blowback or whatever it is you know it is something you're going to have to live with if you don't do something about it and you have to decide whether or not that's okay there's levels to that but if you see something and you want to do something about it there's absolutely avenues to that and if you see something that's hurting patients innocent people um and it stays with you and you can't mm-hmm. shake the feeling that's that's the feeling telling you you should you should say something 
and maybe bring it to the attention of the office so they can fix it. You know, maybe they don't realize it, but I'm going to guess that most of the offices realize it and uh, you already know where you're going to go with that. So, yeah, you know, a couple of the articles that I read are about DSOs. I don't even know if I want to go down this road, but well, there's good and bad DSOs, DSOs that have um, monetary goals and they're, they're really pushing the doctors and the associates or an associate in a practice, really pushing them to make goals, um, financial goals. And that means billing some things. Now, I will say, too, um, there are some codes. Teresa, you could clarify this. There are some codes that don't make it fraud, that they just code differently. And so um, if a an assistant goes in a practice and they're not used to that code. They may say, oh, it's fraud, mm. but it's not fraud. It was coded maybe perhaps differently or correctly in that practice. Well, the, the key to that is just making sure the documentation can support whatever code is used. If the documentation right. can't support it, that's a pretty good tip off. But yeah, that's a definitely a nuanced subject for sure. And and again, it goes back to having a practice or a business that has open communication. And if somebody says, wait, why are we doing it this way? They feel like they can actually ask that question and get it answered without somebody looking at them like like they're a moron. Yeah. Well, and and you said DSOs earlier, and yeah, there's bad, there's good, but I can tell you the most greedy dentist I ever worked with was a solo dentist who had two locations, and he was just, it was exorbitant how greedy he was. <laughs> so that one always I will remember uh, that, wow. and you know he would never make it in a DSO because of the ethicals and the, 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 I think the fact that people are looking at reports and looking at the clinicals, that type of doctor would never last in a DSO because it's a risk like Mm -hmm. the way he was. Um, so I, I mean, they're all over, you know, there's bad consultants, good consultants, um, (laughs) you know, all over. There's bad yeah. baseball players. There's good baseball players. Oh, we I mean, can't talk about that. Oh, that's Kevin. right. We're, I'm sorry. Never see, mind. We're not see, talking about you guys that. See. We weren't going to talk baseball. That's right. Sorry. And there, <laughs> there are bad teams. They're bad and owners. They're, okay, you guys bad are bad owners. <laughs> y'all are going to stop. I see, thought we were not talking about baseball. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. I get that. Move sorry. along. Jeez. Next subject. Sorry. Not even yeah. my podcast. No, no they're in, 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 <laughs> hey, you know. There's nobody out there that loves and cheerleads for dental assistants more than me, but I'm going to tell you, there's some bad ones out there. There are, there are bad. No, I know it's hard to believe. I know, but there are bad, there's bad everybody out there. And again, I think that's where you've got to as an owner, do your background checks and, and also be honest that if somebody is a cancer in your practice, what are you doing to make sure that even though there's a hiring crisis, that that's not the lesser of two evils right there is keeping it. Is. Oh yeah. Zap I can't tell that you person this. out. Zap the number out. of times I've had an embezzler and they say, Oh, I can't let her go yet because you know, I don't have anybody to replace her. And I'm like, what? That's so kind of just dumb. let her keep stealing money. And you know, you can watch it. Uh, and I want yeah. to go back to something I said a minute ago. Setting financial goals is not wrong. You know, that's a good Mm -hmm. thing. I don't want it to sound like that's a horrible thing that the DSOs are giving them financial goals. They're just talking about how unrealistic some of those financial goals are based on what insurances may or may not pay. So. No, that goals was, are good, but the the fact that the DSO incentivizes over treatment, and some right. do, and and some pro- solos do too. I think that's what you were talking about the the incentivizing yeah. of treatment that's unnecessary. It gives us all a bad name. And Kevin and I talk about those often. And let me do an ad on our podcast. Chew on this. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was subtle too. Look at that. Also that found <laughs> on the Dental Podcast Network. There you go. <laughs> The same network as mine. That's Amazing. right. <laughs> We're just incestuous. I mean, okay, that's terrible. Whatever. Don't say that. That is not a word. So our editor, can can you cut that out, editor? He probably <laughs> won't, but just in case. No, I'm pretty sure she won't. <laughs> She'll leave it in there. Yeah, there'll probably um, be a quote. Yeah, it probably will be. Just put it in the show notes. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I'm just... Um, I I do want to say it's kind of like to piggyback on what you were saying a minute ago, Teresa, that the 
there are times when maybe you've communicated that this isn't the way this should be done. Um, and you've brought it to the attention of the practice. Yeah, I, Cause I will say there are a lot of times that practice owners have been misinformed to believe that something is legal mm -hmm. or accepted. Mm -hmm. And so if sure. an employee comes in from another practice that they know that that's not legal, you know, and they bring it to the owner's attention of, Hey, you know, I just, you know, you've got to be, first you have need to be an owner that's going to receive that information and do your own research to find out if it is or isn't. But then you've got to be a bold employee. I mean, seriously bold employee to be able to present that in such a way that it's listened to. Hopefully you would have a manager that would be open to that and uh, would help to solve those problems. So, so I guess my hope for everyone, my wish for everyone is that if you do see something that you're not uncomfortable with, that you can talk about it and it can be ironed out. But if you don't and things are bad, you know, you got to decide if you want to say something because it's not just you, it's other people that you need to think about. Yep. Yeah. The, one of the cases in the article talked about unneeded dental services to low income and they were filed with Medicare, of course. Mm -hmm. Texas has had a lot of Medicare, fraudulent Medicare cases. Oh, Medi sure. Medicaid cases filed. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, your population is huge. I mean, so it, it makes yes. it makes total sense. And you have that in, I mean, Alaska, That's Kevin and I did the whole hoverboard dentist thing where they were bilking Medicaid Alaska. Both the manager and him went down uh, for that. Yep. And sh rightfully so, because they were terrifyingly evil when it that comes was, to that. That. Was, that was a great podcast, by the oh, way. Thank you they very should, much. They should listen to that. Yeah, you should probably link it. How about that? Oh, I could do that. <laughs> Brit Brittany could do that. <laughs> that'd be good yeah that was an interesting one <laughs> yeah and so yeah we, i think we probably have a lot of cases just because there are bigger demographics but yeah well what else can we talk about this or kevin and i are going to revert to baseball i know no i just i just want everyone to feel like they they can say something if they um do say something if they do see something uh but yeah don't take it public I would say that first, like on the Facebook group and doctors, you have to ask yourself, do you have this environment where if somebody suspects something, can they come to you before it yeah. hits some sort of organization that can take your license away? Yeah. And, and I think the team members have to understand that there, there are avenues that if something's going on to take it up the chain of command, for lack of a better term, and make sure that they're doing things the right way rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to go public with this or I'm going to go report this on my Facebook group. You know, that's that's the the worst thing <laughs> in, in every way, shape or form that you could do. I just want to that if 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 everybody walks away with one point from this, please don't go blab on Facebook. Please don't yeah. just go share it in a group and, and, oh and air gosh. out your dirty laundry and, and go there. I'm done and walk away. The stories I could tell you guys, but I won't put it on a podcast of of things that I've read that were actual embezzlement cases and the person uh people have put it out there that they in their groups it's just it's it's interesting the things you read and I I feel like there's a lot of retaliation that goes on in doing that a lot of justific self justification oh, a lot yeah yeah you know, that by by posting it on there um but, you know, those, um, is it, uh, what insurance company is it that's doing those ads? You don't really need to say it. You don't want to grow up to be the old person. Um, oh, uh, progressive. You don't want progressive, to be, uh, yeah. turn into your parents. I love those yeah. ads. Yeah. Yeah. So some things don't need to be said. That's what I always want to say. You know, you just don't need to comment on everything. We all see And it. you don't, you don't need to put it out there. Yeah. It's sad to read. So if you're going to blast your office, let us know who's having sex with who. Like, that's what we really want to do. Come no, on. I don't want to know that. I do. That's Come also, on. That's also been in some of my embezzlement cases. Kevin that's and I other, would read that. That's a whole other podcast. That we that's do. that's <laughs> salacious. I like that. Ooh, stuff. salacious is my favorite. <laughs> Ooh, that's a big word. So, it's, it's one you know, of my you favorites. Don't, 
You haven't been on that for Words with Friends. I haven't seen that on there. All three of us play each other, by the way. <laughs> I, I have never been able to use Salacious. If There's I can too many letters. That, that'd be fantastic. Anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Just know anyway. I'm thinking it. <laughs> yeah, right. Salacious. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so I just, the other takeaway is in your hiring right now, making sure um, the container store has has a, in their code of ethics, one great employee instead of three good employees. And so look for your good hire, your great hire, not mm-hmm. just your good hire, but a great hire that's going to plug in and be that person, not just, you know, as Kevin said, a heartbeat um, <laughs> that can fill a position, which I, I got to tell you from what I'm listening they're I mean, they're ready for heartbeats. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you do buy, if you do, get a heartbeat, then make sure that you spend time on training them and train them the way that you want your practice to be run. Just don't throw them out there to the wolves right now. We we said on our last podcast that people are looking for somebody with a pulse and opposable thumbs. Yep. So opposable thumbs is a plus. If you can get that, you're halfway there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and communication, that'd be the other t- takeaway. You've got to communicate with your team members. Um, make sure you have open lines of communication both ways so that the all of your team can communicate with a business owner. And if you're the team, that you can communicate with the business owner as well as the office manager. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And and make I'm sorry, sure. Sorry, my dog snored. I had to shut him up. <laughs> and, and and I think it's important that there is a chain of command. There there are levels of command in there that the wherever you are on that chain that you feel like things can move up and down rather than just being a dead end one way or the other. Uh, I think that that's really important. Don't be shady. How's that? Boom. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That that that's, was the that's the motto. That was that was our other podcast, Teresa. That's shady right. Dental. Yeah. We did a podcast on Shady Dental. Welcome to Shady Dental. <laughs> it was basically what kind of what would happen in this office if it was like the most illegal, shadiest office ever. And so we gave, went over all the characteristics and, and, and this would be a part of Shady Dental. <laughs> yeah, it would be. It would so. be whistleblowing on Shady Dental. There's That's a lot what we going should. on. And maybe I'll name in the podcast that whistleblowing at Shady Dental. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> any other bits of advice you could give our listeners other. I, well I, I, if you're I, in fact if you're not in dentistry let me let me address that because i do have listeners that aren't in dentistry if you're not in dentistry if your business has a government contract they are supposed to uphold and there are whistleblowing avenues for you to um uh, go to and i'll tell you that there is the whistleblowing website, a part of the U.S. Department of Labor, and it is whistleblower.gov. Pretty easy. You can go read about all the things. So if your corporation is performing illicit activity, then you can uh, see what you, if you've had exhausted, I will tell you, still believe you need to communicate. And you need to let them know and to try to figure out if it really is illicit activity. Salacious. Salacious. So <laughs> salacious. You need to behave yourself. No. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm He's bringing, thinking about baseball. That's his thing. I'm, he wants I'm, to I'm, talk I'm, baseball. I'm bringing the male demographic in here strong with this episode. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's a reason I have all my girlfriends on this <laughs> wow, podcast. Wow, so Hurtful. rude. Hurtful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Poor Kevin. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we could talk about um, whistleblowing in baseball. Ooh. We Look could. at him. He gets we very could. excited. All right. I'm going to log off now. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we're not going we to do that to my girl T. Not do that. Uh, no, no I, I, I think one, just one little thing I want to throw out there just real quick um, is the fact that I know that there are a lot of practices out there and, and the whole hiring for heartbeat thing that we've talked about. But I think 
whenever you're bringing in somebody from outside the industry, just to go back to a point you all were making earlier, because so many times I've heard people are going to restaurants and saying, gosh, you've got a great personality. We'd love to have you, you know, help present treatment plans or whatever it might be. I think it's important for them to understand what kind of industry dentistry is and what kind of business you have even before they ever walk into that firm. Uh, because while somebody may have a great smile and really connects with people, there's a lot more that goes into hiring somebody than just that. And I think it's important for employers to remember that. Well, I really appreciate you guys joining me on the podcast today, even Kevin. Oh, and uh, wow. I know oh. Teresa's been on at my table many, many times. And always a pleasure. Always yeah, valuable I'm... information. I'm never doing this again. So there. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we could do a baseball. You know what, Kevin, you and I need to talk about. This is a good one. We need to do this because I wrote an article one time because I have, you know, if you know me, you know that I have season tickets for the Texas Rangers. And just to fill you in, Kevin writes sports articles for the Colorado Rockies. Can I say that? You can. So, so <laughs> we talk baseball all the time. And I wrote an article one time about being able to see the guys in the dugout. And I can tell when they show up at the dugout, if they're engaged in the game, you know, on the way that their body behavior is, the way that they're showing, whether they're leaning in and standing at the fence, whether they're back sitting at the bench. And so we should probably talk about that sometime because I feel like offices are the same. If you'll have me back, I would love to do that. Absolutely. Well, let's do it. And maybe you and I can talk about that on the Dental Assistant Nation podcast as well. Oh, Ooh. oh, that was a subtle plug. There Very is. nice. <laughs> we could. <laughs> that was very subtle. Well, anyways, thank you guys again. I will put both of their contact and both podcasts. Actually, there's three because Teresa also has one called Nobody Told Me That. Um, so that's that's three of theirs. And I'll put all of those in the show notes for you to be able to uh, click on and listen to. I will tell you, podcast listening has become even more popular. Um, my The guy that mows my yard, you guys, said, so you've got a podcast. I want to listen. Oh, that's funny. Wow. So I, yeah, so I sent him in on uh, the pot, the shows that are in the embezzlement news because he was really excited about that. And I sent him to the one that I did with you, Teresa, about the Corsicana fruitcake embezzlement. Oh, that was fun. Yes. Yeah, that was that was actually probably one of my most fun podcasts. I had well, a lot of, course, of fun with that one. I was on it. But also, I, I have good memories because you sent me a fruitcake <laughs> from that store. So that was yeah awesome <laughs> they are known for their fruitcakes right kevin you probably won't get one because no. she's probably like not on you. that's that uh, i see how it is that's yeah. maybe next time <laughs> maybe. i'll send you a texas ranger or something <gasps> i can't wait <laughs> all right guys thanks so much for all the information as usual i hope that this podcast has helped the listeners uh, make good decisions about employees that they're hiring right now in the current market and encourages them as well uh, to have that open communication in their team meetings as their practices. Take care. And if we can help you in any way, we are so here to do that. Until the next time, signing out. That's a wrap for this podcast of Money In, Money Out. Thanks for listening. Be sure to write down the most valuable tip you learned today so you don't forget it. And remember, you can find out more about all the valuable books and services Susan has to offer at www.susangunsolutions.com.